Hello and welcome back to this series on topic modeling and text classification in Python for the purposes of the digital humanities or anyone who is interested. In this video, we're going to be working with the TRC dataset, which I'll show you in just a second. It's on the right over here. And we're going to be using that data set to do some TF-IDF or topic frequency inverse document frequency. If you're not sure what this is, check out the earlier video in the series when I went over TF-IDF. And if you're not sure what the library is that we're going to be working with, Scikit-Learn, go back and watch the previous video in the series to learn about Scikit-Learn. This video is going to presume that you know both of those things. So the TRC Volume 7 Final Report is a list of things like this. It's a list of people and descriptions of the acts of violence that uh, kind of befell these individuals. So you can kind of go through and see that we've got 22,172 different individuals and descriptions of violence. And our goal in this video is going to be to take these very, very short descriptions of violence, usually one or two sentences, and do some uh, TF-IDF clustering with them. We're going to do this with using the TF-IDF algorithm in scikit-learn, and then we're going to cluster them using k-means. So let's just jump right in, and we'll be explaining this as we go forward, but first and foremost, we need to import all of the libraries that we are going to be using. Uh, I can't remember if I'm going to be working with pandas, but go ahead and import pandas as pd just in case. Uh, that's a good way. If you don't know how to use pandas yet, I'll make a series on that. It's a way of handling data as data frames in Python. From sklearn.featureextraction.txt, uh, we're going to import tf, oop, tf, idf, vectorizer. Make sure you get all those capitals and lowercases correct. The next thing that we're going to import is from sklearn.cluster, we're going to be importing k means. Remember, capital K, capital M, E A N S, all lowercase there. And that's going to be what we use for clustering. From sklearn, we're going to import from uh, metrics, we're going to be importing adjusted rand score. And then we're going to import string. This is going to be useful for a little bit of the cleaning of the text that we're going to have to do. And from nltk.corpus, we're going to import stop words. And I'm going to show you uh, how to handle those in just a second. You're going to need to download the stop words ahead of time. And I'll be explaining stop words in just a little bit. Next, we're going to import JSON, uh, import glob. And in fact, I'm going to do this with my handy dandy function that I got that go ahead goes ahead and writes all those for me. It's attached to my stream deck. Love the thing. And finally, we're going to import RE. These functions just allow for me to easily load and write JSON file uh, data uh, with one line of code instead of having to write this out multiple times in a script. I always like to kind of import those um, with most of my scripts I write. Okay. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to work with, actually, the first thing we should do is just run this and make sure we've imported everything correctly. And it looks like we have. So if you've installed Pandas, if you've installed Scikit-Learn, I've shown you how to do that in the last video. Make sure you've installed NLTK um, and all these other uh, libraries are standard with Python. So let's go ahead and just put a, a number sign there just to keep that kind of up and easier to read. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to want to work with that data. So let's go ahead and load in the data and make sure we can load it correctly. I'm going to be calling this descriptions because that's the tag I'm going to grab in this. If you haven't seen the data structure yet, I'm going to be posting this in the repo and the link for that will be in the video in the description down below. If you notice that we've got an open uh, dictionary and it only has two keys, names, which is going to be the name of the victims and descriptions, which is going to line up with the, the same index. And the description is going to be what we want to grab here because that's what we want to actually cluster. So we're going to simply load data and we're going to use my handy dandy load data function up here. And we're going to load in data backslash TRC uh, dot, uh, underscore DN dot JSON. That's this file. And we're going to just strictly grab the descriptions because remember, it is a, a dictionary. So we can call just the key of descriptions because that data once loaded is going to be just the same way we would load in any or work with any other uh, dictionary in Python. So that's going to grab us all that. And it's always good just to make sure that you've done everything correctly as you go. So let's print off descriptions and we see that it was loaded correctly. We grab the first index right there. So that's our description. The next thing I'm going to do, and there's probably a better way to do this. I'm just going to do it like this. We're just going to say names equals load data, and we're going to load in the names as data uh, backslash uh, trc underscore dn.json. 
and we're going to load that in as names. So we're going to grab that. So if we print off descriptions, we can also print off names zero, and we should have that loaded correctly now as well. And in fact, we do. And that's the description that goes along with that specific victim of violence. Now that we know that works, we can get rid of that. That's fantastic. The next thing that we need to do is we need to start cleaning up these docs. So we should probably write a function so that we can do that and adjust the function and not the script down the road. So let's call this function clean. Let's call it clean docs. Why not? And that's going to take one argument. Let's have that just take all of the all of the docs. We'll pass all the documents to it, which will be so it's, it's going to expect a list of these descriptions. All right. So what we're going to say is we want to grab the stops and we're going to say stop words dot words English. And that's going to call this NLTK stop words. Um, if you need to download the stop words, I'm going to include some code for you in the description down below so that you can download the stop words. Because if you haven't downloaded these yet, you're going to have to do that first. It takes a few minutes. I can't remember how big the file is, but it's, it's pretty easy to grab. So once we have that, the next thing we need to do is we need to get rid of some of the stuff that's going to cause us some errors in our clustering. One of the things that you'll notice in this is that we have a whole bunch of data that we probably should try and clean up. And I'm going to do this a couple different ways. Um, I'm going to have one function that removes stop words and also removes instances of, let's see if, let's see if I can find one. Um, it's instances where we have this AC code. Uh, let's make it capitalized sensitive. Here we go. Uh, these little things like this, these parentheticals, are going to throw off our our uh, clustering down the road. So one of the things I want to do to clean up these documents a little bit is I want to get rid of any instance of these numbers because it's going to be looking for these things um, and trying to use these like AC numbers as a way of clustering when they're not relevant to clustering the language itself. The other thing I want to get rid of is I want to get rid of all these dates. Now, there's a couple different ways I can do this. I can use Spacey, use its NER, the small model, find dates and remove them. Or I can do something that's a little less computationally expensive, and I can use regex to get rid of all the numbers and come up with a list of simple months and get rid of all the months by just going to that list of months and removing those from the text as well. And that's what I'm going to do because it's quicker and it works the exact same way. And I've got a handy dandy list that I'm going to be dropping down in uh, this repo as well of all the different months in English. There are no abbreviations here in these texts, I don't believe. So this should cover everything that we need. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and make a, another function for removing stop words. So let's call it remove stops. This is going to take two arguments. It's going to take a text and it's going to take, oh, it's going to take the actual stops, stop words. So what we're going to do is we're going to first try to remove, we're going to call this function and this function in just a second. First thing we're going to do is we're going to try and remove that text or remove that, um, those AC numbers. So Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to copy and paste this in. It's a regex formula I've already written. All this says is it looks for any instance of uh, AC followed by a slash followed by uh, one to four numbers followed by a slash followed by one to four numbers. If it finds that, simply replace it with this, nothing. And that's what it's going to be what it does. So it's going to go through and remove all of those uh, AC numbers like we see right here. Okay. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to try to remove all the stop words. I'm going to write this out in a little bit more of a verbose way, just so you can actually see what's happening more easily. So we're going to say words is going to be equal to text.split, and we're going to say final. It's going to be an empty list that we're going to append to and then reassemble the text as, uh, as we move through it. So we're going to say for word and words, so it's going to go through all the words in this text that now has this AC removed, we're going to say if word not in stops. So if it's not in the stops that we pass to it, so the stop words in English, the words like the, a, uh, an, things like that, how, etc. But these conjunctions, these articles, these things that don't necessarily mean a lot when you're doing distant reading. So we're going to say if it's not in stops, then final dot append, and we're going to append that word. Fantastic. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to recreate the final object as the final list joined together together. So we're going to use that standard Python function of join, and we're going to reconstitute that object. 
Now what we need to do is we need to uh, kind of go through and remove uh, various things. So we're going to remove punctuation. So we're going to say final is going to be equal to final dot translate. So we're going to use the translate function. This is a fun little trick. Um, we're going to say make trans and we're going to just basically remove punctuations from our text. And this is a fairly, oh, there we go. Uh, we're going to so punctuation, punctuation. I think I spelled that correctly. And that's how you remove punctuations in Python or one of the many ways of doing it. And then finally, we're going to say final is going to be equal to uh, that dot join. And we're going to join it together uh, for uh, I for I and final, if not, and if not, I dot is digit. There we go. And what that's going to do is it's going to uh, create for us a, a new object that is going to be the same text that doesn't have any numbers in it. So it's going to get rid of all the numbers. So that's going to get rid of all the numbers from our text. And finally, while there is a double white space in final, we want final to equal final dot replace. Get rid of the double white space with a single white space. And what that's going to do, this is my my fun little trick I developed a long time ago. It gets rid of all instances where you have two spaces and just gets everything down to just one. So every single spacing will only be a single uh, a single white space. Cool. So now what we can do is we can return final. And what that's going to allow us to do is use that function to pass all of that stuff to it and we can kind of clean it up real fast and easy. So let's go down to this clean docs function. We're going to call that in a second so we don't have to run that each time. So we're going to say months is going to be equal to load data. So we're going to load in our data months dot JSON. That's going to allow us to load in all of those months that I just showed you a second ago, which is just a list. And then we're going to say stops is equal to stops plus months. So that's going to allow us to create a custom stop list with those um, with those months and the stop words from NLDK. So we're going to say final is equal to an empty list once again. And we're going to say for doc and docs. Now we're going to iterate over every doc that we pass to this function. So each of those descriptions, we're going to say for doc and docs, clean doc is going to be equal to remove stops. So we're going to call this function up here that we just wrote, which is going to take two arguments, text and stops. And we're going to say, remove stops, the text that we're going to pass to it is the doc. So each individual description, and we're going to pass also in the stop list that we've just made, which is the standard stop list with a few custom elements added in. And now what we're going to do is we are simply going to finally say final dot append, uh, and that's going to be the clean doc. And then from that function, we'll return final. So it's going to take a list of docs, clean them all up for us, and then send them back. So let's go ahead and test this function out. So let's say that we want to, um, let's say we want to create some cleaned, uh, let's say a cleaned docs. We're going to make that equal to clean docs. We're going to call it, and we're going to pass in descriptions. So we're just going to copy and paste descriptions down. So we're going to take in that data and pass it all the way through. And now let's just take a look and see what it looks like. So we're going to print off cleaned docs zero. And hopefully I didn't really print anything off here. I'm hoping that uh, that we're not going to have a problem. We're going to print off descriptions zero here and we're going to print off cleaned docs zero. I always like to do this just to see what the clean docs look like compared to the old ones. And so we've got the first one printed off and we've got the second one printed off now. So we've had the documents completely cleaned. Now we're not going to see a lot of differences here because I don't believe this one has an AC number, but let's just move over real quickly. Uh, what do we notice that is clearly missing right away? The punctuation is gone and that's because of this bit of code in line 33 right here. What's the other thing that we notice? Well, the date's gone, right? So we have OFC, OFS right here and uh, police open fire. The date is completely missing. What else is missing? Well, the other thing that's missing are the parentheses. So we've removed parentheses from that text. And yeah, like I said, there isn't an instance of AC in here, but I promise you those are gone too. So we know that our cleaning functions worked. That's great. That's the hard part. Believe it or not, that is the hardest part of all of this. The easy part 
is now simply writing the code to vectorize and create our TF IDF model or vectorizer. So we're going to make an object called vectorizer, vectorizer. Yep, I spelled it correctly. We're going to call this TF uh, lowercase f IDF. Uh, I always remember that vectorizer with a capital V here. Now, this bit of code is all over the internet. I am not claiming that I've created this. It comes from the docs, and it's circulated on uh, Towards Data Science. It's on Brandon Rose's blog. It's on machine learning uh, clustering uh, on GitHub. Uh, this is nothing that is original to me. I just want to be that make that very, very clear. Uh, we're going to do a few things here. Uh, TFIDF vectorizer takes on a lot of different arguments, and you can spend a good while exploring them. Here's a full uh, list if you're interested. Uh, we're only going to be using a few of these. Uh, and again, like I said, this is just a very basic introduction. I encourage you to go to the link I'm going to give you in the description down below, which will be to the documentation of the TFIDF vectorizer, and you're going to be able to play a lot more with it on your own. This is just to get you where you need to be to start. So we're going to, uh, first, we're going to pass in one argument. That's going to be the lowercase parameter. We're going to make that true. What that's going to do is it's going to lowercase everything for us. Max features, we're going to set that equal to 100. Max DF um, is going to be equal to 0 0.8. You can play around with these numbers if you want to. Men DF is going to be equal to uh, 5. Uh, and then finally, we're going to set an n-gram range. I'm going to explain these in just a second for you. Uh, and that's going to be equal to a tuple. And that's going to be equal to 1, 3. And then I'm going to also pass in stop words. And this is what I do. I like to get rid of stop words twice for whatever reason, just in case um, these stop, word lists, stop words lists are a little different. I can kind of account for that. I'm going to go ahead and slide that over just a little bit. There we go. Okay. So let's explain each of these in, in depth. So lowercase being equal to true, what's that going to do? Well, all that is going to do is that's just going to make sure that everything that it receives, all those different texts, as it's trying to perform the TF-IDF algorithm on it, all of those texts are going to be lowercase. Why is that useful? It's useful if you're working with kind of uncleaned uh, data. And I, it's always a good practice to think about doing lowercasing before you actually just go off and do it. Now, the max DF, if you notice, I've got this set to 0 0.8. I'm going to copy and paste or bring over the actual documentation so you can kind of see what these things actually mean. So max DF, when building the vocabulary, ignore terms that have a document frequency strictly higher than the given threshold of corpus specific top words. The parameter represents a proportional of the documents integer absolute counts. So what does all that mean? What it means is that imagine this as a percentage. So words that occur in 80% of the documents uh, those are going to be ignored, anything higher than 80%. Now, let's look over at min df. When building this vocabulary, ignore terms that have a document frequency strictly lower than a given threshold, and you can read all that on your own. What does min df mean? Then it's a integer, not a float, because it's not a percentage. If uh, uh, ignore words that don't occur across the whole corpus, uh, with a minimum number of times. So if a word doesn't occur at least five times in this case, it's going to be completely ignored from the TEF IDF algorithm. These are very important parameters that you are going to need to experiment with in great detail. So that's going to be what, what that is. The n-gram range is going to be 1, 3. n-gram, this is another way of saying bigram or trigram or unigram. n-gram is n, so any variable, gram range. So you pass a tuple for a range for this. The first index is going to be the low end of the range, and this is going to be the high end. So I am telling it, I want it to look at words that occur anywhere from one, so just a single word, to trigrams, three. I can make this as high as I want to. I can make this as low as I want to. I can make it where it only finds bigrams and trigrams. There are certain problems where that's useful, so it's good to know this. Stop words, as you might expect, I'm not going to pull the documentation over. Stop words, it's just going to find stop words that it recognizes as stop words belonging to English and remove those as well, or just simply ignore them entirely. So that's going to be what that is. Um, I believe that explains all of those. And we're going to go ahead and just move on. So that's creating our vectorizer. In order to actually use the vectorizer, we have to pass something to it. 
What are we going to pass to it? We're going to pass a list of strings. We're going to pass our cleaned documents. And we're going to create some vectors here. We're going to say vectors are going to be equal to vector iser dot fit transform. And we're going to just pass in our cleaned docs. So we're going to pass all those documents to it. The next thing that we need to do is we need to get a list of feature names. So you're going to see what these are in just a second. So feature names are equal to vectorizer dot get feature names, no arguments passed. Very important there. Next, and we're going to see all this in play in just a second. Next is going to be dense. It's going to be equal to vectors dot to dense. Again, no arguments passed. And we're going to make a dense list. And that's going to be equal dense to list. It's going to list everything out for us. All keywords. We're going to make this an empty list. And so what we're going to actually do now is we are going to create a simple for loop. And we're going to say for description and dense list, x is going to be equal to 0. We're going to make an empty calc uh, counter. Keywords is going to be equal to that. I'll explain all this in just a second for word and description. If word is going to be greater than zero, so if it's an actual word, we're going to say keywords.append feature names x, and then we're going to say x is going to be equal to x plus one. So oh, x plus one, we're making a counter. And then finally, we're going to say all keywords.append keywords. So what we're doing here is we're going through and actually extracting the uh, the words for each description. And this is going to be important for what we do next, which is clustering our data. So how are we going to cluster the data? Actually, before we go forward, it might be useful to kind of see what's happening here. So I'm going to print off all keywords zero. And we're going to let this run. So right now, what it's doing is it's going back through and it's re doing everything that we just saw in the past one, past few uh, sections. And it'll help if I actually have the original descriptions zero. Uh, so we're going to see what, what these look like next to each other. What you're looking at here are is the result of the text being ripped down into just TFIDF. So it's taken, it's gone through everything, this vectorizer. And it's removed words now that don't have a threshold of 80% or that are under an 80% threshold. So they occur in less than 80% of the documents and they occur at least five times. And it's removed the words that don't meet that criteria. They're not stop words and it's all lowercase. And now what it's done is it's removed them. So what we have here is A and C. Notice that and is gone. Notice that A and C Y L. I'm actually kind of surprised. That must occur in a lot of documents to not be in there. Uh, but know that we notice that we also kind of go down the list and we can actually see what this text looks like once it's been uh, altered significantly. And these are telling me, when I look at this, the key words of this entire description. So it reduces this description down to these salient terms in respect to everything else in the corpus. So the words that are really important here are the words ANC, which we know occur in here, ANC supporter, house, injured, member, police, sap, and severely shot and supporters. So we can kind of go through and see where a lot of these are coming from. We see the SAP, we see the ANC, we can definitely see police, members, supporters, and we even get a sense of shot and severely. That's going to be important when we start looking at other methods of topic modeling. So essentially what this is, is it's a list of all the keywords in each description. That's what we've done here by using the TFIDF. So that's TFIDF in a nutshell right there. But in order to actually take TFIDF and leverage it for topic modeling, you need to cluster this. So what we need to do now is take this list of keywords for all those 22,000 uh, descriptions and we need to cluster them together to see where there's overlap. And we're going to do this by using k-means. k-means is a clustering technique that is built into the uh, scikit-learn library. So we're going to say is model is going to be equal to k-means, because remember, we imported k-means way up here. Let me zoom up for you. We imported it right here from the scikit-learn uh, cluster. And we are going to go down here. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to pass a few things to this. Uh, I always find it's good to actually have, um, this is again in the documentation, true K. This is going to be the number of clusters that we want to see or topics that we want to see. This is going to be the K. So N clusters is one argument that it's going to take. And we're going to say that we want that equal to true K. And it's good to have this because we're going to use this number multiple times. If you're using an object multiple times in Python, always make good to make it a variable that can be reused as opposed to having to change that object in the script at multiple times. We're going to pass in another argument in it. It's going to be equal to K dash means means plus plus. And we are then going to say max iter is going to be equal to 100. How many times it goes over in, in it? It's going to be equal to 1. And that's going to allow us to create a um, essentially a model. So we can fit the model by saying model.fit. And that's going to be a K means model for us now. And now this is what's really cool about this is that now we can actually go ahead and take that data and start using it. So we've passed all these vectors from the vectorizer to the k-means. What it's going to do, it's going to take all those vectors, go over all of our data and tell us what each uh, description, it's going to cluster all of our descriptions and tell us where they kind of fit in respect to each other. So to see that printed off, there's a couple different things we can do. First, let's do order centroids equals model dot cluster centers dot arg sort. No arguments there. And we're going to make a list here. And there we go. And two, uh, negative one. Okay. Uh, next, we need to get the terms vectorizer dot get feature names. We're going to get the feature names there. That's going to allow us to kind of re assemble everything. And now we're going to load that data. Let's drop it into with open. We're going to drop in the results of these clusters to trc results dot txt. We're going to write with an encoding equal to utf8, my personal favorite encoding uh, as f. And we're going to say for i and range of true k, so for i and the range of the number of clusters, in this case 20, we are going to helps if you close the for or start the for loop correctly. We're going to say f dot right cluster. Ooh, cluster. Let's do f here. Cluster i. We're going to say f dot right. Enter a line break so we can print that off. And then we're going to say for end and order centroids. Let's go across all that. I. We're going to grab the first. 10 words for each topic. It's always good practice to do this because uh, typically what happens in topic modeling is the num the first 10 or 5 or 20 or 30 words are going to be the words that give you a good sense of the actual topics. So we're going to say for that, we're going to F dot right. And we're going to just do this right now. We're going to do old school with that. Uh, percent S. And then we're going to tell it to populate that with terms end. There we go. That's going to go down that list. And we're going to do f dot right line break. And what you'll see what this does in just a second, I promise. And finally, we're going to do f dot right. Uh, I always like to do this. And we're going to do that one more time. Ooh. And what we're going to do is we are going to write all this. Ooh, uh, where did I go wrong? f dot right terms end. Oh, there we go. There we go. So what this is going to allow us for us to do is to go through and actually write these clusters. It's running right now. It's doing the k-means model. That's going to take a little bit of time. And uh, it has no object cluster centers. Let's see what I did wrong. I forgot the underscore after cluster centers, it looks like. Yep. Now it should work just fine. So what we're doing right now is we're creating that model, the k-means model. It's taking in all of those vectors, all of those keywords, and it's looking at all 22,000 descriptions purely as a list of keywords. And now what it's doing is it's taking those and it's identifying patterns across them and linking up individual documents. And we've printed it off to, where did I print it to? Data uh, TRC results. 
So if we look right here, we can actually see cluster zero. I think everyone who's watching this video probably has the same reaction. Here we're dealing with concepts of burning, uh, and we set up trigrams as a possibility. So burnt IFP supporters, burnt IFP, uh, house burnt. So we're seeing some clear overlap between IFP and burning. Now, what's interesting here is you can make some deductions that uh, there's a connection between burning and the IFP supporters. So there is an overlap, not just here of types of violence, but violence being performed by or being performed on specific groups of people. If we're scrolling the list, again, I haven't pre-looked at these. I'm kind of reading these as we go along. Uh, cluster 1, definitely looking like an SAP cluster. Uh, and what's interesting here is SAP stands for South African Police. What we're seeing here is a looking like to me like a something really closely attached to police brutality. I would call that probably the police brutality cluster or just the police cluster or the SAP cluster. We're seeing things like police beaten, injured uh, severely. I'm surprised we're not seeing concepts of torture here. There might be another cluster for that. Uh, so cluster number two, we're going down. We see IFP supporters again, except we're seeing a specific region of IFP supporters. So that's interesting. So cluster number two and cluster number one are overlapped a little bit in uh, subject matter with regards to the type of people involved or what groups of people are involved. But this is more of a regional distinction, whereas cluster zero is a type of violence dis uh, description. And cluster three, we're seeing amnesty, granted amnesty, ANC, members killed, shot, injured. Uh, this is clearly a shot cluster, cluster four. So what we're seeing here are clusters. They are topics. And what we're able to do then is get a really good sense about the different topics or clusters that might be involved in our uh, our data set without actually having to read our data set. Cluster five, clearly some concept of political violence is uh, overlapping here. So this is what TF-IDF and K-Means is really good for, getting a good sense of the topics at hand without actually reading any of the documents. And I just picked 20 at random. You're going to play around with this for a little bit and get a better sense of, um, of the different type number of clusters that you want to do. Do some trial and error. But I picked 20 at random, and it's looking honestly not too bad. I'm seeing a lot of really good, uh, really good clusters that do make sense. We're seeing concepts of security, operatives, granted amnesty, tortured, detained. So again, overlapping with kind of the SAP concept. These are more obviously probably um, uh, higher up in the government officials that are doing uh, that are being granted amnesty possibly, and they're actual operatives torturing and detaining people. So we're seeing really, really clear clusters here. Is my point. And what this tells me is immediately without having to even read the data, what is being discussed in it and how there might be overlap between these descriptions. What is the drawback then of TF-IDF and K-means clustering? Well, the main drawback that you're going to find is that when you're using K-means, it forces every single document to conform to one topic. As we as humans know, that's not always the case. Sometimes documents, particularly ones that are longer, are going to have multiple topics within them. So where do, how do you do that then? And that's where LDA comes in, latent derelict allocation. We're going to be seeing that in the next part of this series as we explore more machine learning options for doing topic modeling. And that's going to be where TF, IDF, and LDA really kind of show their clear differences is the ability to pass to, uh, documents to a LDA model and actually uh, understand more nuanced ideas about the topics at hand. So we're, we're going to be able to see multiple topics coming out of individual documents. In my experience, TF-IDF is always better for shorter texts, like what we see here, these short descriptions, whereas LDA is better suited for longer texts. So text beyond, let's just say, 100 words or so, LDA is going to be much more useful. And TF-IDF is fairly computationally light. So if you're working with a lot of documents, let's say a million, and they're quite short, such as maybe tweets, I'd recommend exploring TF-IDF first before moving into the more computationally expensive LDA models. That's going to be it for this part of the tutorial, though. I hope you've got a good sense of what TF-IDF is and how to kind of implement it with this script that I'll be including. It's not only going to be included on the GitHub repo, keep an eye out because there's going to be a textbook coming out on topic modeling, and there'll be a, a work, a notebook that walks you through each of these steps in much more detail. And when that's available, I'll have a link in the description down below for it as well, and also a pinned comment in the comment section. That's going to be it for this video, though. If there are any questions or if I went over something too quickly, 
don't be afraid. Drop a comment in the comments down below and I'll be sure to answer it. That's all for now. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe down below and join me in the next part of this series as we explore LDA and more machine learning approaches to topic modeling.